Now, when I started um, studying history of art at Cambridge 20 years ago, um, I joined Cambridge as an undergraduate student in 1999. History of art was very much a Western Europe-focused discipline. Um, studying even German art was seen as a little bit eccentric. So you can imagine that I didn't come across many Polish artworks at all in my undergraduate course. And because um, I was born in Poland and have traveled to Poland a lot um, during my childhood, I knew that there was a lot out there that could be incorporated into art history and that should be incorporated into art history. But I uh, slowly realized that there were many barriers to this. And over the years, uh, thankfully, the situation has changed. And I'm pleased to say that this year, for the first time, um, the undergraduate diploma in art history at the Institute of Continuing Education in Cambridge will include a module that I'll be teaching on um, the visual culture of Central Europe, which will include a lot of Polish material and um, it feels like uh, quite an achievement to have reached that stage and art history is changing very fast but it still remains one of the more traditional disciplines it's quite different from history um, as such because um, art is often driven by the art market and Polish art has not featured very prominently in this however there are many interesting um, artifacts and works of visual culture which can be uh, introduced to uh, international audiences that is audiences not from Poland um, and I'm showing you two examples on this first slide so on the left um, the there are two chapels you're probably familiar with these um, there are two chapels at Wawel Cathedral in Krakow the one on the right with the golden dome is um, a very famous uh, chapel built by um, Zygmunt uh, I the the old in, um, it was finished in 1533 and it's a very important high renaissance building mm. and it's been seen by international art historians as one of the most important European examples of high renaissance um, architecture. But what's also important is that it's, it spawned many copies within Poland itself. Uh, one of which is the chapel on the left with the darker coloured uh, cupola and that chapel it was built for the Vasa dynasty. Um, there's currently an exhibition about the Vasa dynasty at the Royal Castle in Warsaw. Um, so looking at these types of royal patronage, we can really link Polish art into international uh, discussions about art history. But there are also some completely new uh, artefacts that can be brought to discussions, such as the coffin portraits that I'm showing at the bottom right. Now, th that's how they're displayed, not in the galleries themselves at um, the National Museum in Poznań, but that is how they are stored. And you can just see how many of these examples there are. And this is the type of artwork which, when I travelled to Poland, having been exposed only to the sort of Western European art, I could see that this was a very different sort of artwork and something quite exciting that should be pre presented to international um, audiences. Coffin portraits were placed on the end of the coffin during funerary ceremonial um, in Poland, and then they were often displayed in churches as a lasting monument, and they're quite an evocative art form, um, slightly, you could say, macabre, but certainly very interesting for international audiences. But we're speaking about Poland in the early modern period, the early modern period being 1500 roughly to 1800, and that embraces the largely Renaissance and Baroque art of Europe. But what was Poland like at the time? Well, as I'm sure most of you know, Poland was part of the Polish-Lithuanian Commonwealth between 1569 and 1795. And that brings with it certain challenges, uh, because this is a vast area. It's one of Europe's largest early modern states. And in order to study the art of this state, which is very much interlinked, it's actually quite hard to draw Polish art out from among this um, area. Um, in order to study this, you'd have to know quite a few languages. So not only Polish, although Polish is very useful because in Lithuania, printed, early printed books were often printed in Polish. So Polish is very useful even for studying Lithuanian material. Um, but as you can see, the landmass covers current Poland, Lithuania, Ukraine and Belarus. So you would need to know those languages to read the modern scholarship. But also in order to read um, 
the, the other historical books, you'd need Latin, you'd need church and chancery Slavonic for uh, the Grand Duchy of Lithuania, also um, Hebrew. So there are lots of different languages that somebody would need to, uh, to cover that area. And in fact, if they knew all of those languages, and I'm yet to meet such a person, they probably wouldn't be an art historian, they'd probably be a linguist. So this is a real challenge um, for, for art history. How do we present this to international audiences when the material is so vast? But today we are just focusing on Poland, and this is actually a map taken from my book on the visual, um, visual cultures of death in Central Europe. So how do we uh, present this material from this uh, vast area to an international audience? Well, the most important thing is um, to have some visual resources to share with um, any audience, Polish or international. Some of you might recognize the book in the top left-hand corner. In fact, uh, could I have a show of hands? Does anybody recognize Janusz Kębłowski's Dzieje Sztuki Polskiej? Yes, some of you do. Yes, this, this was a real staple book in people's um, home libraries. Um, it was published in 1987 by um, Arkady, which is the, um, a very well-established art and architecture publisher in Warsaw. It um, started in 1957 and um, is still continuing. So their books were, were very much uh, bought by people within Poland and were sort of at the top of their game. However, as many of you will uh, perhaps know, during the communist period, the quality of art history publications within Poland itself, not even talking about what was available in terms of images of Polish art abroad, um, even within Poland, you couldn't really get a hold of good quality images. So the bottom left image is um, Bernardo Bellotto's um, Krakowskie Przedmieście um, in Warsaw, which is the same image that I'm showing you at the top right there, but the bottom left is taken from Janusz Kambowski's Dzieje Sztuki Polskiej, and you can see already, if I walk away from this, can you still hear me? You can probably still hear me. You can see that here, this area, you can't, that hasn't even printed properly. Down here, you can't even see any of the people, so you're not really getting a sense of this artwork. You could not study that artwork from that slide. It would be um, really tricky to say anything useful about it at all. You'd have to see the artwork for yourself, which means you would have to be in Poland, which means an international audience would never have got to see that artwork in any meaningful way. Um, now, of course, there are huge uh, changes with, um, with the, the digital resources that we have available and the better reproductions that are available in books. And I particularly am very excited by websites such as the, can you hear me? Can any, any problem? Yeah, you can. Right, the Polona website, um, which is the website of the National Library in Warsaw, the Biblioteka Narodowa, and it's available with English language as well as Polish content. Um, you can do a search, you can, you can find whole rare books that are scanned in. I mean, there are books that I travelled all the way to Poland to study and now they're available on the internet. It's, it's really incredible. Um, and also what's really important is copyright free images because art historians, when they're publishing things, they're very driven by um, what is free to publish or not too expensive. And um, there's a real copyright problem around images. If, if we can make Polish artworks accessible, free from copyright, then a lot more people will be including them in their publications, I'm sure of that. Um, and then there's content as well from museums. So this logo here is the, um, the National Museum in Warsaw digital, um, digital um, library logo. So you, again, you can go online and you can search through their images and all of these resources are available to everyone and we just have to publicize them. So I, mean, I, I do a Twitter feed and I sometimes write something, you know, go, go and look on this Polona website, go and have a look, copyright free images. And you know, art historians, I say, do get very excited about these sorts of things. So there are lots of, um, lots of opportunities out there. But we don't just need digital content because digital content is often bitty, it's sort of cat little catalog entries. We need some really meaty studies of Polish art and they need to be in foreign languages, not in Polish, because um, as much as we would like everyone to learn Polish, um, having had to sort of keep learn, relearning Polish, you know, living, living in England myself, I know that this is a really tall order, and um, you know, we, can't, we can't expect people to learn Polish. Polish art history has always been very strong. It's always been a very rig rigorous discipline, lots of publications. These used to be in languages like Italian, German, and French, if you look at the older articles. Um, 
they would often have summaries in those languages, not so much in English. Now, pretty much all the translations that are done are into English. They're well translated. Um, and also the quality of the exhibition catalogues produced by um, museums in Poland is excellent. Uh, the only problem is sometimes these books have a, don't really get into the libraries in the UK, for example, um, in sufficient numbers for me to be able to put them on a student reading list. So that is, that's the sort of thing that we need to overcome still. We need to get these works much more accessible and into the library so they can be used. Um, the top row shows uh, works about Polish art in the early modern period, which are completely in English. They're, so it's, they're, they're whole books that have been translated and very well translated into English. So at the top left, the, um, a, a book on the King Sigismund Chapel by, by the main expert on that in Poland, the, um, one, of the, one of the professors who's worked on that the most. And then um, various other exhibition catalogues as well, so the Polish Commonwealth Treasures. The catalogue of the, um, the Poland Museum in Warsaw um, a really interesting museum and an excellent catalogue with lots of good visual content, lots of paintings, and paintings that you wouldn't often see included in Polish art history books. So this is really exciting to, to have that sort of material. Um, and then the Renaissance Barbell, again written by um, top art historians in Poland, but it's been translated and very well translated. And at the bottom, some examples of exhibition catalogues which include English language content. But again, these are just um, short snippets about the paintings and what we really need is the big studies we need some some books that put polish art out there in in a way that that captures people's imaginations and that um, really draws on um on themes that are representative and unique to poland so i think the best example of that is an exhibition catalogue um, available fully in english but out of print now called Art in Poland. I don't know whether any of you have heard of this exhibition that was uh, in 1999, Land of the Winged Horsemen. It went around various sites in the United States and also in um, Warsaw. It was called Kreis Krzyglatych Jeźdźców. So this is um, an incredibly evocative title. Uh, so it's not just something boring like you know, art, uh, just the, the art of Poland. It's, it's got this, this evocative image of, um, of warriors, and you've got these winged horsemen on the front cover. And the articles are by, again, top art historians. And that catalogue um, is still the best, probably the best book on Polish early modern um, art that, that I would suggest to a sort of general or, or more interested reader. And Polish art historians have also published um, works which are available in UK libraries. So uh, Jan Białostocki, um, who was one of the most important Polish art historians of the 20th century, his Art of the Renaissance in Eastern Europe is um, an important book as well within British scholarship. So that's, um, that's really exciting. And then Baroque in Poland is by Mariusz Karpowicz, who's also um, published a lot in Italian, and he works on, on the Baroque period. But then some books are really quite disappointing. So Baroque Art and Architecture in Central Europe by Eberhard Hempel is, um, is part of the Pelican history of art and hasn't been updated really since the 1960s. And it has a very traditional view of art where it's all about styles, it's like what kind of columns are included in buildings, which buildings um, sort of follow on from one another. And, and that is still the major English language book about Central European art, which is, which is a bit of a shame. I'm more excited about works such as Court, Cloister and City by Thomas de Costa Kaufmann, which, uh, in which he wants to include um, the Holy Roman Empire, Poland, the Kingdom of Hungary into a wider um, dialogue about European art. And he wants to pull those countries in into a wider discussion so, so isn't it for it not to be just about Western Europe. And that's the sort of book that we need more of, really, bringing um, Polish art back into uh, the wider discussion. Now, one of the main questions that people ask me when I say I study Polish art is, um, which artists do you study? Would I have heard of them? And I feel like they're almost waiting for me to say that there's a Polish Leonardo da Vinci that we haven't, um, we haven't yet you know, heard of. Um, and of, of course, I can't do that because that's not the main thing about Polish art. Polish art um, often works on the basis of itinerant artists coming to Poland, uh, being drawn in by powerful patrons within Poland itself. So the Sigismund Chapel that I showed you earlier was built by Sigismund the Old. And on the top left, um, 
he was uh, portrayed by Hans Dürer, the, the younger brother of Albrecht Dürer, um, who was court painter to Sigismund, and um, he was uh, commissioned to decorate Vavel Castle and various other things. So we've got these itinerant artists coming from other countries being invited by Polish patrons. Another example is um, Bernardo Bellotto, who worked um, in the 18th century for uh, the Polish court. And then there are some artists who depicted Polish individuals but never really came to Poland themselves. Um, one example, bottom left, uh, Stefano della Bella was a um, Florentine draftsman and one of the best printmakers of the 17th century. He depicted Polish uh, riders, so Polish sort of soldiers, light cavalry, uh, in various different guises, but he got a lot of this information from a visit uh, by the Polish ambassador to Rome in 1633. And he did a 2.5 meter long printed um, depiction of that visit, of this entourage of the Polish ambassador. Uh, but we can gain a lot of information from that, and the type of artwork is in itself very accomplished. And on the right, one of the works of art, sort of Polish works of art, that has been um, written about probably the most, without it <coughs> possibly even being of a Polish person, uh, but Rembrandt's The Polish Rider in the Frick Collection in New York um, shows somebody in the, the kind of outfit of, um, of a Polish warrior. And um, again, a very evocative image which really stirs the imagination and can be much discussed. However, as you can see, these, the names of the artists aren't, um, they're, they're not Polish, they're itinerant artists who depicted Polish individuals or they came to Poland. Um, so in fact, what would be more useful is to look at patronage. So the Polish um, patrons who were in a powerful position to bring in artists or to choose what kind of art they wanted to display. And I'm giving you two examples um, here. So at the top left is a sort of composite painting of the art collection of um, one of the Vasa princes. He went on a grand tour around Italy, Germany, the Netherlands in 1624, and then he brought back lots of things. And these things that he brought back are important because they show what his tastes were. And of course his tastes wouldn't be out of place in any other European court. Um, he liked things such as the, the drunken um, Selenus by Rubens, which is this image over here. Um, there's uh, Bruegel, the Elder village scene up there. There's the Rape of the Sea by Women by Gian Bologna. And there's uh, a sketchbook, an example of excellent draftsmanship. So he had the very, very similar taste to, to any other royal patron in Europe, as did um, Stanisław II, um, who was the last king of Poland, and his collection is now in the Dulwich Picture Gallery. And it includes work by artists such as Rubens, Murillo, Rembrandt, Van Dyck. So again, his tastes, the, the art collection that was amassed for him, which never reached him, uh, because by that time, 1795, um, the Polish-Lithuanian Commonwealth fell apart, it's now all in the Dutch Picture Gallery, and we can see these sort of artworks, and we can see the taste of the Polish royal court, which, as I said, is not out of place in any other royal um, court in Europe. And the fact that we can see these works in London is also very important, because one of the big challenges to presenting Polish art to international audiences is that um, there's very little that they can see within their own collections, which is the the product of Polish art patronage. Whether that's artworks made in Poland or things bought by Polish patrons, a lot of that has stayed in Poland. A lot of it has also got lost, uh, has been destroyed. So, um, so having places like the Dulwich Picture Gallery where you can go and say, yes, this was created for a Polish king, we can study the whole, the, the, in a sense, the vision of his collecting tastes within that space, that's very important. But of course, royal patronage isn't the only type of patronage in early modern Poland, and it's probably not even the most interesting. Uh, for me, the most interesting patronage is that of all those other groups, the people who were aspiring to be like the people just above them. Um, so coffin portraits, which I mentioned at the beginning, these works of art produced for funerals, these were produced in very large numbers and by a very diverse range of society. Um, in the early modern period, Polish people ranging from the middle classes to the minor nobility, 
to the higher levels of the nobility spent a lot of their income on funerals, on funeral pageantry and ceremonial. And this is another way of understanding their interest in visual culture. They liked that element of a display, um, of flaunting their wealth in a really transitory sense. So there's nothing that's left of those spectacles apart from some accounts in rare books or these sorts of um, coffin portraits. Now we know that these portraits were not just done by Catholic communities, they were also found in Protestant communities. Um, so the top left picture, um, quite shockingly, of a two-year-old girl from a Protestant community. Um, now she's shown um, in her ideal state, which means the state that she will be um, at the, the, um, the resurrection at the Last Judgment. And she's shown open-eyed because it's that anticipation of the new life. So um, even though these are images of death, they're really thinking about the, the new life in heaven. That's what they're um, sort of envisaged as being. So we know that these works of art were commissioned by Protestant communities, and they were also commissioned by Orthodox communities. Um, in, for instance, Lviv, the uh, a painting of an ennobled Greek merchant, um, these sorts of images are much less well known and much less studied. And a lot of images have been lost as well. And these, these types of paintings, these coffin portraits, which are really quite unusual if you look at European art as a whole, they, they really are just in Poland um, and also in some parts of Lithuania closer to, to Poland. So in Vilnius we know that they were executed by um, Catholic and by um, Orthodox communities, and we just have records of them being commissioned. They were often painted by uh, local artists, so this is the sort of local art production that we can see. The very first coffin portrait of this type might be an example of royal patronage, however, I'm just showing that in the middle uh, there, um, uh, King Stefan uh, Batori, who was um, of Hungarian origin and whose influence upon Polish art might uh, stretch quite a bit further than just the tradition of coffin portraiture. Because now I'm going to, to speak about um, a different type of image and also about the tastes of the Schlachter, the nobility. And I've got a poem here which just shows how very aspirational uh, the Schlachta could be. There was a, a great financial uh, divide between them. The Schlachta could be very wealthy, um, or they could be very, um, re just very ordinary, um, hardly really have any, anything to their name at all. But they constituted uh, about 9% of the population, so they're a, they're a large patronage group, and they're all trying to commission the same sorts of artworks. So this poem from the 17th century tells us a little bit about their aspirations. I'm just going to read it, and the, um, the words are slightly different than modern Polish, so if you excuse uh, the, the spelling of, and the pronunciation. Choć nie wisi lanczow tnowy na mej ścienie rubensowy, kunterfetów też nie wiele i nie dziło do labele. So what he's talking about, this, um, this is a very ordinary member of the Schlachter. He's talking about what's in his house. And in his house, he knows that he doesn't have fine artworks. So he, d oh, two minutes left, oh goodness. Okay, <laughs> he doesn't have fine artworks. He, um, you know, he aspires to Flemish art. He aspires to Italian art. And the thing he aspires to is this sort of painting, which I'm showing you here on the right-hand side. Um, a very famous painting. Again, you probably recognize this. It's from the Wawel Collections in Krakow. It's of um, Count Stanisław Tenczynski. Um, again, a very evocative painting which draws the viewer in with the excellent artistic quality, but it displays many features of what we'd call the Sarmatian portrait, um, which is the, the fact that he's got these clothes which are rather different to Western European clothing. And I was going to go, go on to talk a little bit about how tastes in Poland um, oscillated between East and West in terms of of dress and how that's really an interesting aspect of the Schlachter culture, that they are sometimes depict this is the depictions of the same man on the left. He's in Western European dress and 
20 or so years later, he is in sort of Polish dress, in inverted commas, which has um, references to the, to the near, <clears throat> near and Middle East. So these are, these are the sorts of images that we are likely to find in the homes of, um, of, this, of the author of this poem. He would maybe not have the fine art of Western Europe that he knew he should aspire to, but he probably would have a Sarmatian-type portrait, uh, which is one of the aspects of Polish art that um, I think is of great interest to international audiences. And um, currently an exhibition at the British Museum inspired by the East. Um, I haven't yet seen it. I imagine it doesn't contain Polish artworks, but it really should, because these are the sorts of works that should be brought back into the European, uh, wider European framework and the dialogues about art history. And I'm probably at the end of my time now, am I? No? Yeah, pretty much. Okay, I'll, I'll finish there. Thank you very much. <laughs>